All righty. Good morning, everybody. I hope uh, everyone that's joining us live this morning is gonna ha is having a great morning so far. Uh, I know I am, uh, and I hope, and I think uh, our guest today, uh, Doc Donald Connor, is is having a good morning. I'm very glad he's going to be able to join us today and really cover some great history, not only First Force Recon history and some patrols that he was a part of. Um, his team leader, as uh, was a prior guest, uh, retired uh, Colonel Andy Finlinson, who Doc Connor is featured in this book. And while I'm speaking about books, uh, he is also featured in this book, a fellow corpsman wrote, uh, G.L. Lewis, Doc Lewis, Nothing But a Thing. Um, great book as well. We'll actually be speaking about both books today. But um, as I said, Doc Connor is uh, or was a uh, member of Force First Force Recon. He was with Killer Kane under uh, First Lieutenant uh, Andy Finlinson, and he was the corpsman on the team for, gosh, uh, almost a year, I believe, before he was wounded. Uh, he'll get into that, but we've got some amazing stories, and before I uh, talk any longer, Let's let the man tell a story uh, uh, before we get into questions. Um, Doc, the floor is yours, sir. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, it's a privilege to be here. Uh, again, trying to cover some things here that I think will be of interest to your to your audience. Uh, first, probably a little background on myself. It will give you a little understanding of, of where I came from and what I did. Um, I was raised in a career military family. Uh, my father and all three of his brothers joined the military during World War II. Um, so my future was to be in the military, and that was the career that I had planned to take. Uh, I was also very fortunate, and then I had a lot of special operations influence uh, as I was coming up. My father, uh, 25 and a half years, retired with 10th Special Forces in Bad Tools, Germany. Uh, his younger brother, Ernest, uh, was with 1st Special Forces and 5th Special Forces. Uh, had one in the Air Force, and the only one that was in the Marine Corps was a flamethrower operator with 2nd Marine Division, wounded on Tarawa, and then later killed on Saipan the second day of the invasion there. But that was kind of where the background came, being raised in the military, and especially around special operations. Uh, that's obviously what I wanted to do and how I started out heading that direction. Uh, so in 1965, as soon as I got out of high school, I joined uh, the military, wanted to be a corpsman because I'd heard so much about corpsmen and how well and, and how important they were to the Marines that they served with. Um, went through core school and things like that. Uh, after I got out of core school, I was assigned to uh, a hospital there in uh, Millington, Tennessee, outside of Memphis. I immediately went to the commanding officer and volunteered uh, to be to go, be assigned to the Marine Corps. Uh, it took about four or five months to get that run through. And I, so then in late 1965, early 1966, I went to 2nd Battalion Recon uh, out at Onslow Beach. And I stayed there with them and went through diving school and worked off a submarine down in the Caribbean and went through various schools uh, during that time uh, and was in the process of myself and a, another corpsman were volunteering to go to second force recon because battalion worked in a little bit larger groups, uh, usually didn't get quite as much training as the force recon guys. And as we applied and we're trying to get over to second force recon, uh, we got orders to Vietnam, uh, which I had volunteered to go to as well. Uh, unfortunately, when I first got to Vietnam early in 1967, uh, when we were going through processing at Da Nang, uh, they just arbitrarily assigned you to who they wanted you to go to. And for some reason, despite my contesting it and giving them a hard time about it, I was assigned to uh, Whiskey 311, which was a four deuce mortar battery, uh, nothing at all to do with recon. Uh, once I got over to that particular company um, on the south, very southern side of Da Nang, 
I immediately went to the commanding officer and complained and explained that I wanted to go to recon, but it's an all voluntary group. Um, so I made some local operations with them uh, before I was allowed to find my way over to Force Recon. Uh, so I hitchhiked all the way across Da Nang and went to uh, Division Hill where uh, Camp Reasoner was, which was where Force Recon was located. And uh, upon arrival there, I met a corpsman there by the name of Mike Laporte. Mike was a, a great uh, surfing looking guy from California, very experienced, a lot of time with the company. Uh, Mike took me to Commander, uh, to Major Lowry, who was a commanding officer for First Force Recon at that time. And I explained how I wanted to get over to Force Recon, get back with the units that I'd been with in the United States. And he agreed, said, you go home, pack your stuff, I'll get your orders. And it was a very short period of time that I was brought back over to First Force Recon. And that's actually the retorted way that I got back over with recon in Vietnam. Uh, I made a few patrols, break-in patrols and stuff with other teams, uh, with Brisbane uh, and various other teams to break out and learn the ways of the bush. Uh, then I was very fortunate at that time to finally get assigned permanently uh, to the 5th platoon, which was uh, overseen by Lieutenant Finlayson, later Colonel Finlayson. Uh, and it was just in that team that I got to do the majority of my patrols and stuff. So that's kind of how I, how I got into the business, how I got back over and how I finally became assigned to Killer King. That's uh. <clears throat> And I'm glad you uh, gave a, 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 a more family-oriented bio to, to lead off because we usually get questions uh, considering the Vietnam vets were usually raised by more than likely WW2 parents, at the very least, Korea. Um, so a lot of our viewers are very interested about hearing uh, family history. Uh, it, some, of, some of it find it more interesting that guys that – you know, had no family history, no interaction with anybody in the military, but yet didn't wait for the draft and immediately signed in. But then you've also got to just be in awe and respect uh, families with military service like, like yours. I mean, you, you mentioned your father uh, was a 10th group man uh, in Bad Tolls, Germany. Uh, where the uh, really the the original Green Berets were were at, um, and that's also where uh, Dead A and all of them were were kind of running around uh, during the Cold War. Um, your father, or uh, was your grandfather uh, a, a flamethrower on Saipan? Did I remember that from our talks? No, one of one of my my dad's youngest brother. Uh, oh God. Uh, JD was with the Second Marine Division, uh, the flamethrower operator. He was killed on Saipan, second day of the invasion of Saipan. My God, uh, I've got a uh, great book on the the recon element or the raider elements and um, the Marines on Saipan, Saipan, and I think it's <clears throat> uh, Lonely Thieves. I, it's in my reading pile in there, but I recommend anybody checking that book out and, and seeing what those Marines are. You can look at the Pacific and they do a, a dadgum good job at, at showing what the Marines during their island hopping campaigns were going through. I mean, that's uh, you, your family history is absolutely amazing. And kind of before we get into questions to kind of lead off to where the viewers can get some questions in, um, I, I found it very interesting that uh, your brother also, Special Forces, 1st and 5th Group, um, if I remember correctly, you also, you ran into your brother, uh, while he was in country and you were in country, uh, in Da Nang, didn't y'all? Yeah, actually where I ran, it was my, my dad's youngest brother, Ernest, and Ernest was with the first and the fifth special forces. And as I was heading to Vietnam, we stopped in Okinawa for a short period of time to get some, uh, inoculations and some other training and then headed on to Vietnam from there. 
and I actually ran into my dad's brother there. He was with First Special Forces there, and he was one of the instructors that was training at a uh, on-site jump school that they were sending Marines and uh, Army people and, you know, South uh, uh, Vietnamese soldiers back to Okinawa to go through jump school. And then later, he came over to 5th Special Forces and was with 5th Mike Force out of Da Nang running uh, Roadrunner teams and, and stuff uh, in the western part of uh, Vietnam. What a, uh, I mean, what a, uh, again, what a family history. I mean, my goodness, y'all y'all were, uh, all of y'all were at the forefront or uh, as they say now, the tip of the spear. I mean, that that is unbelievable. And how how interesting for you to run into your, your dad's youngest brother while he's with the, the Mike forces uh, over there. That That is unbelievable. Um, and, and you had mentioned, uh, oh, I'm sorry, were you about to say something? I was going to say, yeah, and, you know, my entire family, as well as my immediate family and my extended family, I think I'd sent you a picture. Uh, one of my biggest fears wasn't necessarily getting injured or hurt, but was getting captured because of the operations we did and how, we, how far we operated out. My father-in-law... Uh, was in fact a prisoner of war for the Germans for two and a half years. He was he was in the army, was captured uh, on the second day of the invasion of Salerno, Italy, and spent two and a half years in Stalag 3B uh, prison camp near the Polish border. Hey, uh, and I've got that those photos, and I will be bringing them up momentarily. I hate. Um, I got caught off guard, but they are in our text chain and I'm getting them ready. But one of the, the more interesting things that I, uh, and especially with the, 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 the force recon guys, as you mentioned earlier, that, um, your, your dad's youngest brother was on Oki and was doing the, the, the jump school and, and all of that. We've heard of guys, um, doing in country jump school in, in Vietnam. Uh, as a matter of fact, maybe Rabbi, uh, Larry Quigley and a few other guys, I, I think, uh, completed in country, but then, uh, Doc Norton and, uh, maybe rabbis, I think Rabbi actually had to go to Oki. Uh, were, did you ever, uh, did, did you go to any of the, the jump schools while you were, uh, in, in, in service with force recon, either at Oki or in country? No, I, I never made any schools out of there. Uh, I stayed in country my whole time. Uh, you know. Now, some of the guys that were jump qualified, you know, they made uh, periodic jumps out at China Beach, you know, in a secure area just to be able to keep their, their jump pay coming and, and to keep current on the shoots and stuff. You know, there was a combat jump that occurred which a good many of my team members participated in. There's a select group of people that was picked. Uh, I was not fortunate enough to be on that, uh, but that's where we lost uh, one guy, Doc Laporte, the gentleman that I met that got me uh, in, introduced to Major Lowry and, and helped get me moved over to Force Recon. Uh, he was ended up MIA on that one. Uh, other people that were in my team, Bobby Garcia, tore up a knee on that jump and, and was sent back to the States and, and, and left the uh, country after that. Uh, Jim Hager, uh, who was our LMG operator, uh, and, and uh, John Sloick, who was our one of our point men, uh, all of those people participated in that jump. So uh, they put you where they needed you. you know, most of the time you stuck with Killer Kane, but it wasn't unusual to get pulled to do some other things. And he, that is, uh, ever since I, I really first got into, uh, to speaking to you guys, that, that was one of the, the, the first names that when we, when I did start asking about jumping and, and, uh, such as that, uh, inevitably guys who at least either jumped or were around Doc Laporte always brought this up and, uh, it, 
it's such a strange story, you know. I mean, there the guy is. I mean, uh, gung ho as can be, a nice guy. Um, but there towards the end, as I've heard through the grapevine and the rumor mills, that he may have had a, a Vietnamese wife. He may have packed up some stuff that he took out. Uh, it, 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 I, I recommend guys, uh, y'all look into uh, Doc Laporte's story. Um, it. <sighs> It's a strange one, nonetheless. And then a lot of the names that um, Doc Connor just mentioned, we'll be speaking about later in some pictures uh, I'll be showing. But this is Doc Laporte right here, if I'm not mistaken, when right. uh, before he got in country. I've got some, and I wish I had them, but Rabbi uh, <laughs> sends me just photo dumps, and I've got to keep up with them. But I'll end up getting some more out of him. Um, with speaking of schools, as we're kind of – progressing on um you mentioned uh bu 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 right here dive school um when you were with uh or, or at camp lejeune wh where was uh dive school was that marine dive school navy dive school army well it's a, it was well the navy uh navy and the marine corps and the air force sent all of theirs to the navy diving school in key west florida for self-contained underwater breathing apparatus you know scuba uh, so I went down there and did my, tr my diving training there. And then in Vietnam, I was one of the only diving qualified medics in the company. There weren't that many corpsmen, you know, you had force recon was made up of basically, I'm going to say 150 people, a very small community. Um, the company had five platoons, each platoon had two teams. And so you only had a handful of corpsmen. So not every team went out with a corpsman every time. Now, Killer Kane was an exception. They, they pretty much kept a corpsman all the time because of their high profile and, and Andy's uh, efforts to keep them uh, heavily engaged in some of the more, uh, I guess, critical projects. Uh, but I did do diving operations if, if I wasn't in the jungle and an operation came up, uh, you know, I would go dive on bridges, Namo Bridge, uh, some of the other bridges and around the Da Nang area. And I made one uh, operation out with a grunt outfit in a beautiful place called Elephant Valley, which was north of the Da Nang area and an area where the, in summer of 67, the Da Nang Air Base was rocketed with 122 and 140 millimeter rockets from Elephant Valley. So, I went out with the grunts with three other divers and we were going to, you know, burn out some bills. And as the divers, we were going to check the river banks and stuff uh, for caves and caches and weapons storage. Um, unfortunately, halfway out, uh, the Amtrak that I was riding on top of with the other divers uh, hit a command detonated mine and blew the road wheels off directly below me. And that was the second time I was wounded, catching some shrapnel in my left leg and banging up a little bit uh, as I got gently thrown off the top of that uh, thing. So I did do some diving operations, but primarily my, my operations were with Killer Kane in the field. Yeah, I was just showing a picture of Elephant Valley, and that is uh... – that that's some scary, scary territory that that you guys were in. Happy Valley, uh, the Yellow Brick Road, uh, Antenna Valley, Elephant Valley. I mean, just a uh, lot of a lot of bad stuff going on in those areas. Um, when, if I'm not mistaken, on one of my notepads, uh, did you while we're on uh, water, did you end up having a waterborne operation where you were on a raft for a mission? No, I was not. Uh, one of the guys that I knew with another team, uh, they did make a waterborne uh, approach uh, late, late in the year, uh, just north of Da Nang. Uh, unfortunately, the surf was heavy. Uh, one of the RB9s breached. And because most of the guys, you know, had on H harnesses with a good bit of equipment, uh, unfortunately, one of the gentlemen uh, from Alabama, actually, uh, that had re-enlisted and 
had gone home for 45 days and came back on his second tour, uh, unfortunately was one of the guys that drowned. God. Terrible, terrible, terrible. But, I mean, uh, there's we, – we hear – Countless sad stories like that all the time. It, it's just, uh, uh, just heart wrenching. Mm. Uh, I mean that it, it's. I mean, you had a uh, from speaking to all of the Force Recon men I've spoken to for for you getting in country when you did, and all of the schools that you had been to. Uh, you know, Sears School. I think you even attended a, a special agency demo school. Uh, dive i think you also worked on a few sub ops uh getting in and out of subs i mean you were a, a pretty highly trained individual when you got first got in country i mean yeah there were a number of us that that you know were fortunate enough to have come from second recon or second force you know mike barecki came for instance from second force recon the camp was in uh so there was a small contingent of us that unfortunately had gotten previous training. Uh, it was an all-volunteer group, as I had said before. So you did have people like Doc Lewis, you know, uh, which you, you held up Gary's book. Uh, Gary had been with uh, 1st Medical Battalion just down uh, from where uh, Camp Reasoner was, there below Division Hill, and he volunteered and came over. So he had no experience had no previous training in special operations like that and basically learned all he learned, you know, the hard way on the job, you know, in the bush. Uh, and so people like that to me were exceptional, uh, you know, to have done what we did on a routine basis with no previous training and stuff, but were sharp enough and dedicated enough to have been successful at what they did. Uh, in a really rough environment. Yeah, uh, I I remember Andy talking uh, about his first few snapping patrols, and you know, you uh, you either hit the ground running or you did not last very long with Force Recon. <laughs> yeah, it, well, you know, uh, it's kind of like Bart Russell, who was one of your previous guests. You know, I asked Bart one time and said, you know, geez, Bart. You know, we were there together and part of the time together. And, you know, what do you remember the most? And Bart said, I remember being hot. I remember being tired. And I remember being hungry. Not many times were you really scared. You know, it was it was a very arduous thing. You, you loaded out 60 to 80 pounds of gear on your back. You know, and some of the terrain that you had to traverse was was. You know, it was jungles, it was in the mountains, uh, and so it was hard. You know, it was really hard. You're sleeping on the ground, you're eating cold food, you know, you're cutting out a little bitty square of, of dirt to use the bathroom in and then covering it back up and hiding it. You know, so everything was done in a very, I guess, difficult manner. It was hard, uh, a lot harder than a lot of people realize, you know, that was as much of a a chore or a burden as it was the actual combat portion of it, which, you know, was exciting and didn't last very long, but uh, it was hard sometimes. I, I, I can imagine. And with the uh, op tempo you guys were doing and some of these missions uh, that, that when, when you do get assigned to Killer Kane, uh, we'll be getting, <clears throat> excuse me, guys, uh, some of the missions we'll be getting into were, you know, <laughs> unbelievable. Uh, and speaking of fear, I'm, I'm sure one of the, the incidents we'll talk about that has been covered when Andy came on, but we were going to let you actually describe since it was happening to you, uh, your, your landmine issue. We'll, uh, we'll get into that in a, in a little bit as we get into some of the mission, uh, mission, uh, profiles and such. Um, but, I, I, we're starting to get questions in, so we'll hit some of, of those in just a second. But as you said, you're getting to um, – you're officially over at the First Force Recon compound by June of 67. Is that correct? Yeah, a little okay. bit earlier than that, but pretty close. Okay. And um, I, you're – as you said, you're kind of 
doing some snap ins and and strap hanging until you get a, officially assigned to Killer Kane. Um, can can you talk about what what it was like when he first finally got on a team and and got to meet the guys you were going to be running with for the for the next year, thirteen months, or however long you you could stand it and stay in. Mm-hmm. Well, again, it was, you know, I, I did run several patrols with other teams. I had gotten in com- country with them in about March. Uh, and it wasn't until, I'm going to say, around May that I actually went over to Killer Kane. Uh, I was in awe because I'd heard so much about them. They had, they had already had a name going before I got with them. Uh, and so it was, it was a little intimidating i guess at first because the guys were you know so good at what they did they were all type a theory x hard charging guys uh but was able to assimilate in with them pretty quick they they took us they took me in they kind of you know redirected me and and got me going in the way that they ran and the things that they did you know and killer cane was unusual an unusual team in in that there were probably three or four things that made them stand out. Now, you know, I would have to say quite honestly, there were no bad teams. There were, you know, maybe, you know, you're looking at two teams per platoon and five platoons. So there's, you're looking at 10 or 12 teams at any one time. Usually general makeup was seven to eight people uh, on a team. Uh, And I guess the difference that I saw and, and things that stand out in my mind is Killer Kane was unique and one uh, that it was the team makeup. The, we were very blessed to have people that were extremely good at what they did in the team, you know, as an assignment. Uh, we had excellent point men, Bart Russell, Bob Garcia, John Sloat. They were very good people in the jungle. They knew how to be quiet. They knew how to navigate and pick the best routes, you know, and how to be very aware of their surroundings, good peripheral surrounding uh, things, because they, they're the people that kept us out of ambushes, you know, uh, and kept us uh, a lot of times from getting in worse situations than we would have normally gotten in. You had really great people like Ray Garner, who was our primary radio man, and the guy was just phenomenal. I mean, the minute something happened, he was on the radio. He was getting the fire support. He was getting the fast movers out with bombs. He was getting whatever help you needed and letting people know what was going on. And he didn't have to tell him what to do. Ray just did it, you know. And you had people like Jim Glore, you know, who was the tail end man when we're moving through the jungles. And Jim was a phenomenal guy, and it, he also had good peripheral self. He was also responsible for covering the trail to make sure that we didn't leave obvious uh, signs of where we had been so that we could be tracked and followed. Uh, so it was people like that that made the team what it was. Uh, they were just very good. Uh, I would say the second thing that made Killer Kane stand out was obviously leadership. You know, uh, you had good people like Sergeant Hager who helped keep people in line and keep things going. But mostly you had Andy Finlayson. Lieutenant Finlayson was a unique individual for for an officer in those times. And uh, he went out with Killer Kane all the time. And that wasn't necessarily the case with some other officers. You know, I mean, a lot of teams didn't have an officer. Uh, Our counterpart, Brisbane, uh, was usually went out with a sergeant. In, in charge. So, uh, but Andy, you know, was good about listening to the team. When he first came in, there were experienced people in Killer Kane, and, and he was wise enough to listen to them, to learn from them, and to let that build his experience level. So he was always open into listening to the guys talking and, and input. Uh, the other thing is he was a particular stickler uh, to the point of being a pain in the ass sometimes. Uh, for instance, when we would prepare for patrol, uh, after we got our, our briefing, 
before we went down to the landing zone to go to the helicopters to go out for insertion, um, Andy would take the team off to the side. Now, we were all big boys, and we'd all been doing this for a while. Uh, this is a picture of the team sitting down at the LZ prior to going out. And Andy would get us off to the side, and there was a weapons firing pit. And he would make everybody fire their weapon into that to make sure that all the weapons were functional and ready to go. He would double check all the loadout to make sure that everybody had what they were supposed to have and they were ready to go. And then the part that was, I guess, it probably saved us in many instances, but he would get us off to the side in the heat of the day while we're waiting to get inserted in the helicopters. And we would do action reports or action. Uh, Immediate action drills. Yeah, action drills. Uh, I forget what to call them. But, you know, we would, we would uh, practice ambush front. How do you respond? What do you do if, you're, if you run into someone, you ambush in the front? Ambush left, ambush right, ambush rear. And it was how we reacted and what we did. And those techniques in the end saved us a lot of times. And, and Andy was a real stickler, too, on, on procedural responses. Once you responded, let's say, to, to an incident or a contact with the enemy, you know, we'd gain fire superiority. And if we weren't going to try to capture anybody or to gather information, then we would retreat. We would head out in, in a direction. We'd turn 90 degrees from the trail. You'd go out of ways. Then you turn 90 degrees again and set up an ambush. So if anybody followed you, trying to, to follow you out, then they just walked into our ambush instead of us walking into theirs. So it's a real stickler on procedure like that. And I think that made a big difference because when we did make contact and we made lots of contact, um, we responded in a fashion that kept us alive. And that, that was important. And I, I guess the last thing that I would say that made Killer Kane different is that normally a force recon, uh, you know, patrol uh, uh, brief or the reason for the patrol was basically to go and observe, uh, to observe the enemy, direction of travel, you know, number of people, uniforms, uh, weapons carried, you know, things of that sort that would allow intelligence to best put together a larger picture of what the enemy movement in a particular area was. Uh, and that was the thing is just basically go, hide, look, you know, and if there was an opportunity later in 67, as Tet was, they were building up for Tet, uh, the emphasis changed to trying to capture people. But in the beginning, most of the time that I was there, uh, that wasn't the focus. It was basically go observe, report, and call in airstrikes or call in artillery, depending on where you were at relative to what types of, uh, you know, art ordinance was available. But one of the things that caused Killer Kane to develop the reputation that he did was one of the other teams uh, had gotten in an incident and gotten a couple of guys killed. And one of the gentlemen was Captain Barnes and Sergeant Blankenship were both killed uh, when someone inadvertently tripped a, a, a bouncing Betty and had killed both of them. Well, the, Mr. Barnes was a very close friend of Andy's. And so Andy had a, a very de big desire to engage the enemy. Uh, he wasn't simply satisfied with just looking at him, counting him, and, and calling in artillery on him. He wanted to invoke his degree of revenge by. And so we routinely ambushed people. Uh, we looked for fights. Uh, and as we developed that reputation, uh, when we would get back in from a patrol, for instance, and we'd be out for, you know, four days or five days, uh, we come back in from a patrol. It's, everybody's cleaning up. Landy would clean up and he'd head up to uh, intelligence on Division Hill just above uh, Camp Reasoner where we were located. 
And he would go into the intelligence people and he'd say, hey, what do you got? What's going on? You know, and they'd say, oh, well, we've got this or we saw this. And, you know, we, we're going to. And Andy said, well, my team can be ready to go tomorrow. You know, and so he actively engaged with intelligence, you know, when we weren't on patrol. And as we developed this reputation, we, we got, I would say, our fair share would be a polite way to say it. Uh, our fair share of uh, interesting operations, opportunities to, to to get in some pretty heavy, uh, you know, populated areas of, you know, it was always our biggest thing. You know, whenever you'd go to a briefing, you would hear, where are we going today? And you'd say, oh, happy, well, we're going to go to Happy Valley. And you'd think, oh, my Lord, because that, that was never a good place to go. It was very heavily populated. It was one of the main infiltration routes off the Ho Chi Minh Trail into that fed into the Da Nang and Chu Lai area and uh, very heavily populated by hardcore North Vietnamese soldiers. And so if you were going there, you could almost always count on running into and making heavy uh, enemy contact. Yeah, Miss, I'm trying to show some of the, uh, oh, I just went way past the map. Um, was trying to show some of y'all's AOs uh, here. We've got Enchanted Forest, Happy Valley, the Re Yellow Brick Road, which I've got a great photo, and you can kind of see why they call it that. There's the Quaisons that, uh, and the Antenna Valley. Uh, Jason Holmes, uh, I just sent him Lieutenant Bill Peters' book uh, where they're, really getting into it over there in the quaisons um and like you said uh andy uh some some guys would go so far as to say andy was very very aggressive in uh in his tactics especially as you said when he lost uh his two close friends sergeant blakenship and captain barnes he he really uh they some of the guys said he he was out for revenge and y'all definitely got it because as you said I, I was astounded at how much y'all, how good y'all were with artillery and calling in air because, I mean, y'all, y'all sit there and wait until there was a massive buildup and y'all would rock and roll with artillery or whatever y'all could get in the air and, and sent down and just devastate them. I mean, and that wasn't just one mission. That was several, several missions that, that y'all did that. Yeah. Well, like I said, you know, because of the reputation that we garnered, uh, we got more than our, our fair yeah. share, you know, and that, that's not complaining that it, it was a very, you know, it was a big honor uh, to be looked at like that. But, you know, it did uh, get us in a lot of scrapes. One of the things that I did in preparation for today, you know, as I had talked to you, I'm really fortunate in that I have actual declassified copies of all the patrol reports for Killer Kane and Swiss Scout. Uh, and so, you know, the things that, that I talk about come straight out of here. It's not some old guy's memory from 50 something years ago, uh, you know. And so in preparation for this, what I did was I uh, tried to pick out two or three patrol reports that one would show just the type of, of enemy engagement uh, that we talked about on these patrols where, you know, we had some we held a record for a long time on the, the most number of killed by rifle fire, people that we killed in ambushes and things like that, inadvertent contacts that we made in some of the heavily populated areas we went into. And so I thought, you know, if, if your audience wanted to hear some of that, I could probably go over two or three uh, ones that are pretty notable, uh, ones that certainly I remember. Uh, some that had a, you know, you talked about the incident with a mine. I'll cover that one uh, as well to just show you kind of some of the things you get into. Uh, I know one of the other questions that someone had asked before was loadouts. Mm -hmm. You know, when I alluded to earlier that, you know, being hot and tired, you know, we carried anywhere from 60 to 80 pounds of pack. And so what is unique about being a corpsman? you know, with a force recon team. Uh, and I thought it was kind of special, you know, as, as you would imagine, but, you know, you basically have two roles. And I mean, your primary role, you know, 
you would think would be to be a medic and to treat people and to take care of the wounded and stuff like that. But actually, it became a secondary role. It was your primary critical role when it was needed, uh, but it wasn't needed as often as you might think. Your primary role actually, for all practical purposes, you were another member of the patrol. You were another force recon Marine in the field doing those types of poop and snoop, as I call them, activities, you know, observing, uh, you know, engaging in combat. You know, later you you may have met some some foreman. I know that when you were interviewing Doc Norton, you know, he talked about, well, he had a 45, you know, because of the overactivity and engagement that uh, Killer Kane was involved in, I never carried a 45. Most of the time I carried an M16, just like a lot of the other guys in the team. <laughs> and later in the patrols, uh, I carried an M79 for a while. Uh, and so you were basically another combatant. Uh, and then if somebody got hurt, then of course you had your E1 kit. So a typical loadout for me, uh, you had your M16, you had an H harness and carried about 300 rounds of ammo, uh, 556, five, usually one uh, two pound block of C4, uh, my medic E1 kit, which I hung around my shoulder, uh, anywhere from two to four grenades, uh, two smoke canisters, uh, two different colored smoke canisters that could be used for, you know, extraction purposes or marking things one canister of tear gas cs uh a gas mask uh water and water was the biggest and heaviest thing that i carried uh, i mean if we had ammo when sometimes we'd carry an m60 machine gun which like charles norman williams willie williams would part of the time had an m60 uh we'd have to hump the extra ammo because he couldn't hump, hump all the ammo. So, you know, you'd take, you know, a box of ammo or you'd take, you know, rounds for the LMG. Uh, water, you'd carry anywhere in the hot part of the year, you'd carry anywhere from, I'd say, eight to 10 canteens, quart canteens, and you never had enough water. You were always running out of water. Uh, and then whatever food, now, early in 1967, the majority of food that we had, if you were going to go on a patrol, uh, as you prepped out the day before, you'd get a case of sea rations. And then you got to arbitrarily pick through that and determine what food you wanted to carry. And those were all big old heavy cans of whatever it was you decided to eat with the, you know, uh, they were heavy. It wasn't until later in 67 that we started to get dehydrated rations, uh, which were much lighter and could be mixed with water to have a better meal. But again, it used your water. And water was a real critical thing that you just never seemed to have enough of. So that's basically what I carried. I would have my guys take and put uh, bandages, you know, compact, you know, full before bandages in their jungle pouches on their legs and things like that. Uh, so that if I needed them or they needed them, uh, we had extra uh, medical supplies. So that was pretty much a standard loadout. Uh, so do you have to do some scrounging? Uh, I think I remember hearing uh, you uh, were, were trying to get, I believe from the mic force, you were trying to get some medications and some blankets and, cough syrups or, or tablets to, to be able to take out uh, during the monsoon seasons? Yeah, you know, uh, the Marine Corps, unfortunately, uh, seemed to get what was left over or old and used. And so a lot of times, uh, to their to their benefit, and, and Andy's as well, is we would be able to scrounge stuff that we couldn't get that we really needed. For instance, early in 67, all that we had for our M16s were 20 round magazines. Well, to carry 300 rounds, you'd be carrying, you know, quite a bit. Uh, and unfortunately, the uh, Air Force guys that were down on 
the airfield in Dang that were guarding airplanes had the nice 30 round, you know, magazines. And so, you know, we, we learned pretty quick that, you know, we couldn't get them in our supply, but we could go down and trade camouflage poncho liners, which were useless to us, you know, or K-bar knives. And we traded with the Air Force guys to get 30 round magazines, which were much, much better to get, let you, let you stay in the fight a little bit longer before you have to switch and change things around. And then from a medical supply standpoint, uh, you know, you wouldn't think that you would have a cough or anything, but when you're hiding in the jungle, you're sleeping on the ground, you can freeze to death almost, you'd think, laying on the ground in the rain at 70 degrees. So it wasn't unusual for guys to get a cough or things like that. Well, you don't want to be making noise when you're hide, trying to hide in the jungle uh, and remain hidden. Uh, I could get elixir of turpin hydrate, which is a cough syrup uh, that most people are familiar with. But the real good stuff was ETH, or elixir of turpin hydrate, with codeine. Because the codeine suppressed the cough response and would keep you from making noise like that. In the same way, you couldn't, we couldn't get benzedrine or dexedrine or anything. So if you got in a bind and you had to stay awake for a day or so, you know, you know, trying to get yourself out of a scrape that you were in, we couldn't get those. Well, I developed a, a relationship uh, with one of the medics over with Fifth Mike Force, a uh, guy that later became a prisoner of war, and I would con him out and trade him out and I would get quarter grain codeine tablets and I'd go back and I'd mix them up and make my own elixir of turpin hydrate with codeine and I could get benzedrine or dexedrine from him so if we got in a bind and had to stay awake you know for extended periods of time we could take something like that so things that weren't always necessarily readily available we somehow seemed to find ways to obtain uh, through hook or crook uh, to get us through. Uh, and it was important sometimes to have things like those bigger magazines or the right kind of drugs and stuff that you needed. Yeah, I mean, there the uh, the Air Force has the CAR 15s first. I think that's where Andy gets his first. And then the 30 round mags. And then, of course, y'all having to get medicine from, from the SF guys. And thank God y'all had the gift of gab of, uh, of, of, scrounging and getting things done and, and able to get yourself uh, adequately, a adequately supplied and, and ready to, to go out into the bush. Cause I mean, yeah, the, the Marine Corps, they make do. Uh, that's one thing the Marines do. They, they make do with what they have. Yeah. And it, it was interesting, uh, you know, and it worked to our advantage and, you know, you couldn't have asked for a better team leader than, than Mr. Femmelson, uh because he, knew what it took to get the job done and was interested primarily in being successful with, you know, keeping his guys alive. And, you know, if you, if you look at the different teams that you hear about, and, and you do hear about a number of different teams, teams normally either made their reputation or, or their notoriety with a single patrol. Or, for instance, a, a team like Boxcar. Boxcar was very famous. Uh, but Boxcar got its notoriety from one really, really bad patrol and really, really, you know, tense situations and a lot of press. Killer Kane got their reputation by simply patrol after patrol after patrol, which is successful. Some other teams would make their 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 notoriety, just like, you know, if you're talking about Doc Lewis, you know, uh, where it'd be in an ambush, they'd lose a couple of guys and have a tough fight and, and fight their way out of it, you know, and they made theirs from what, you know, uh, one incident where there were a lot of, a lot of, you know, sad events involved. Killer Kane just did patrol after patrol after patrol successfully, killing a high number of people. And un unfortunately, and, and in a lot of that is to Andy's credit and, um, is we never lost a man. Killer Kane never had a person killed. Now, several of us were wounded, you know, and that wasn't unusual. Uh, most of the guys had been wounded at least once, you know. Uh, 
fortunately, most of them were, were more minor in nature. You know, uh, I think Jim Glore got a pretty big piece of shrapnel in his back and had to be evacuated to uh, Japan for a while and then came back. Uh, but most of us were successful at, at you know, he, Andy kept us alive. Let's put it that way. If, if you want, like I said, what I can do is, if they're ready, I can venture off into a couple of these patrols, cover some things. And would you, would you like? Doing. Would you like to hit a few of the questions first? We've got a, a, a whatever good, your your guys want to do. I'm good. We'll uh, we'll hit a few of them because uh, a few of them are pretty good, and they've gotten in here. And uh, then absolutely, we're gonna want to hear those patrol reports. That's what everybody's. Uh, Want, want to hear um jason he's kind of spoken a little bit about andy here um uh jason you've kind of described it but he was wondering what he was like when you first came in contact how long had be, he been running before you got there well like i said mr Phillison was was unusual for uh most young officers that I had been around in the States and then when I first got in country, uh, they were more a little aloof. You know, they were the officer and you were the enlisted. And, you know, there was that relationship and respect. Uh, Mr. Finlayson required that. I mean, he was very, <laughs> very much an officer, but he was unusual in that he listened. Uh, yeah. He was always willing to, to hear what you had to say uh, you know, you were, you had a, his policy was you had an open door. His hooch was in another part of, of Camp Reason from ours, but you could always go over and knock on the door. He'd invite you in. He'd listen to what you had to say, you know, and several of us went and talked to him and, and about various things at different times, but he was good about listening. Uh, probably more so, I'd say above average, uh, willing to listen to people and assimilate the experience that other people uh, brought to the table. Uh, he had probably been in country. Um, I'm going to say he probably got in late 66 uh, because he rotated out. I was wounded the last time, November 4th of 67, and he rotated out and came back to the States, uh, to, to the Johnson White House area, uh, in December of 67. Yeah, I was trying to find his exact date. He uh, he got in and I'm missing it, but it I, I, you're, you're, I'm feeling you're pretty much right on there. He, he wasn't there too, too much uh, ahead of you, but he, he had definitely been around enough to, to start getting things under control. Uh, wait, let's see. Um, yeah. He was in uh, late January of 67, three weeks of training at the staging battalion ended. I was off to my bachelor's officer's quarters. Um, bu -bu -bu. So, yeah, there uh, early, early 67, he was uh, getting in country and hooked up the first four. So he was there a, a, a few months before you, it looks like. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, uh, guys, if y'all, I, I hope since Andy's been on, y'all bought his two books. This is, he did get a little bit of time back with first force when he came back, but this is mostly, or this is all first force. And uh, it's, it, it's uh, amazing. And really one of the, the thing that really stuck out to me before I really got to know uh, men that served under Mr. Andy, but also really getting to know Mr. Andy is uh, him, him having the open door policy. He absolutely took, uh, uh, is it Watson, uh, Roy Watson, uh, the, the British uh, Royal Marine? Um, he, he, him and Andy at first were, were kind of bumping heads and they came to an understanding, but always, always would listen to his men. And as, as Doc Connor said, there not a lot, a lot of officers did that. They had a, a, a stain, a, a, a air of, uh, I'm a little bit above this and I don't need to listen to NCOs telling me how to run things. And that's not the way Andy operated at all. Yeah, that's very true. Another book that, you know, again, there's probably about five books out there. Another book that I think is, is worth looking into, uh, you know, is, is this particular book. 
because not only does it outline Killer Kane uh, mm-hmm. in quite detail uh, and covering the jump, but it, it talks about a lot of the other teams and their notoriety as well. So, again, there's a lot of good books out there. Uh, I'd encourage you to look at some of those, and it'll give you a little more in-depth detail. And that's, that is kind of the reason I wanted to, to switch back over to these reports so that you get a, a better feel for just how Killer Kane built that reputation uh, and some of the, I guess, uh, nerve-wracking things that went along with that. Uh, so if you, you want to, if you want to, you can go ahead and we can get into that and we'll just handle all the questions at the end as we're wrapping up. Okay. We'll that. If that, or if you have someone that, you know, you're, you're able to see those, I'm not. But if you see a question on there you think is very relative to the particular patrol we're talking about or a question you think really needs to be addressed, then, then just holler at me and we'll drop and answer questions in the middle. Uh, Absolutely. The first one, the first one that I picked out uh, was, again, classic of one, the way we got assigned to a particular patrol and also the type of heavy enemy engagement that we saw in some of these patrol areas, uh, particularly places like Happy Valley. Uh, the one that I'm going to talk about uh, first is going to be a, 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 uh, an observation was made by a bird dog aircraft that they had seen something and they had described this to intelligence in their debriefing uh, of what they assumed to be a 400 millimeter rocket about 15 foot long. Now that was at the time that was about comparable to the uh, Honest John rocket that, you know, a surface to surface rocket that the army had. Uh, It did have nuclear capabilities, but we certainly didn't suspect that that would be the case, but it certainly would have the range to be able to reach a lot of the areas that they couldn't get to comfortably and reach with their 122 and 140 millimeter rockets. So this is one of those occasions where Mr. Finlayson had been up in intelligence, you know, talking to them. And when they said, oh, well, we've got this report and we've seen this, Andy uh, volunteered us to go. And so we got assigned to this patrol uh, out towards Happy Valley. So uh, we load up, we were flying CH-46As, which were at that time able to put in the whole team with seven man on this patrol. And so we were going to look for potential rocket launch areas and to see if we could clarify uh, whether this uh, rocket existed or didn't exist uh, based on the observations they had made. So uh, we flew into the area and uh, as we approached the landing zone that we had, had picked out uh, the day before to go into for this patrol, uh, we started receiving small arms fire uh, on the helicopter as we went into the LZ. And even though we were under fire at the time and taking some intermittent rounds uh, from people that saw the helicopter coming in, we nonetheless got off in a hot LZ and entered our patrol at that point. So in this patrol, we spent about 25 hours in before we finally got run out. Uh, it, was, it was in fact a very heavy, heavily populated area in the edge of, Antenna Valley, or edge of Happy Valley. Uh, while we were there overnight, we heard some chopping and some ax noise. So there was some preparatory work going on up on the ridge lines and stuff above us. Uh, as we tried to get closer to that area to make observations of what that work activity was and what might be there, uh, we came in contact with a, a large enemy force. Uh, and so what I'll do is just kind of read this small section right here to give, because this comes straight out of the patrol report from the debriefs and the intelligence. It says, you know, at this point, as we moved up trying to get closer to the observation area, it said the patrol made contact with an estimated 30 to 40 DC, resulting in a firefight. The firefight uh, resulted in six confirmed VC killed, people that we killed and saw and we knew killed, 
10 more VC probable kills, people that we thought we hit and we weren't sure, but, you know, got counted. So there were 16 people killed in our contact with this group of 30 or 40, and there were seven of us. And in the process, too, it says here, two U.S. Marines were wounded in action, although they were minor. Uh, the VC wore gray, green, and tiger stripe uniforms with mixed helmets and soft covers, armed with rifles, carbines, AK-47s, one light machine gun, Chicom grenades, web gear, and packs. Enemy appeared aggressive and well trained. Airstrikes and artillery were called in to help the patrol beat off uh, the enemy. Uh, the patrol utilized CS gas to break contact, which we, well, on occasion did use that for the purpose of breaking contact. Uh, the enemy wasn't good about uh, having gas masks, and we did so. With Tholomon, throw tear gas. So the patrol, uh, you know, broke contact using CS gas, and the p patrol was distracted under heavy enemy fire. So, you know, typical patrol like that with a seven seven man force uh, wasn't unusual to run into to much larger contingents. Uh, in the beginning, earlier parts of '67. They, if you ran into some people on a trail, uh, they would usually had a limited amount of ammo. Very rare that they'd be carrying over one or two magazines. So the firefights were short in duration. We gained fire superiority, and, and they would fire back for a while, and then they haul. Uh, we would take, you know, whatever we were able to kill and capture, and gather information, intelligence from that. So that was just a, a classic type of patrol, uh, which we did multiple ones of, uh, you know. Uh, other ones that I thought might be of some interest to your audience, uh, the other patrol that I would cover would be Patrol 528-67. And this particular patrol uh, was one of the ones that was uh, kind of important to me or stuck in my mind because, uh, again, the uh, intelligence gathering aircraft that would fly over an area using, you know, heat indicate or, you know, heat, you know, infrared, uh, ammonium hydrate indicators to pick up body sweat. I mean, all the intelligence gathering and out in the far reaches of Happy Valley, they had, had detected an area which they had gotten intelligence indicating there might be a large, uh, you know, storage area for rockets that were going to be brought into the Da Nang area to use against the air base, uh, and also a staging area for large troops uh, and movements. So they set up and cleared through the South Vietnamese for a uh, arc light, a B-52 strike on this area, and then intelligence wanted information about the productivity of that airstrike. So the seven, this particular one, I think we had eight men, uh, after the arc light had taken place, uh, then we went in shortly thereafter uh, to see how effective it was and what the results might have been. Uh, this was in, in the summer of 67, one of the things that, that came to my mind as much as it, as I'd indicated earlier, the normal way that a patrol was inserted, we were using CH-46A Sea Knights, which were capable, they were twin rotor aircraft that were capable of carrying an entire team. So you all went in together, you all came out together. Uh, unfortunately, in the summer of 67, the CH-46 developed cracking near the rear of the fuselage and they pulled all the 46s offline. Well, this was important because the replacement was the older UH-34s, which were the old uh, reciprocating engine, had a radial engine in the nose, a uh, typical uh, Korean War era helicopter. Uh, the bad thing about those were they could only put carry two people with the amount of equipment and stuff we carried. So if you were going out you know, in the jungle environment in, at altitude, um, they could only put two people in at a time. 
Well, the unfortunate thing was those first two people in, radio man and a medic. The last two people out, radio man and a medic. So it, it made the <clears throat> going in on patrol a, a little more risky operation and certainly a little more concerned if you were the medic or if you were the, the right. backup radio man uh, that was going in first, you know, or coming out last. Well, on this particular patrol, we were going out to do that bomb damage assessment. After we did our briefing and we went through all of our action drills and our preparation to, to board the helicopters, the helicopter pilots would always, if they had anything they wanted to talk to you about, they would give you a little briefing as well. Well, because it was 34s, the, <clears throat> the pilot that was commanding the 34 that, that me and Willie were going to go on for the first two going in, he seemed a little nervous and he said, you know, now guys, when we get out there, you know, you gotta, you gotta just do, get out of my helicopter. He said, I'm going to fly in over this ridge line. I'm going to go across the river. And when I get to the other side where you're getting off, he said, I'm going to turn the helicopter sideways, slow it down. And I'm going to hover above a good place for y'all to get out. And you need to get out. I'm not going to sit down because it takes me time to wind back up and, I'm not going to expose my helicopter and my crew unnecessarily. Said you guys get out. Well, Andy had overheard some of this. So Mr. Finlayson came over and he said, Doc, he said, don't be stupid. He said, don't jump out too high because if you do, if you jump out and you break a leg, then we got to, the whole mission shot. We got to come back and we got to spend time getting you and getting you out. He said, so you make sure that he gets down at least low enough because he seems nervous. So sure enough, just exactly like <clears throat> the helicopter pilot had indicated, it was just breaking daylight after they had bombed. We go running in, we go over this ridge line, we cross a river, and he turned sideways and slowed it down. And I was standing in the door, and the, the door gunner was beside me. <clears throat> And I looked down and we were about 15 feet in the air above the bomb crater, you know? And so it's very noisy. So I said, no, no, go down. And so I saw him push his mic to his mouth, assuming he was talking to the pilot about our desire to go a little bit lower. And I looked back out and it was at that time that I felt a big heavy hand on my back I don't know if he was trying to get my attention, if he was trying to tell me to go ahead and jump, or he was pushing me out. But when I felt his hand on my back, I figured he said go. So I exited the helicopter, landed in the bomb crater, buried my M16 up in the mud. <clears throat> and I'm interested because there were supposed to have been about 1,500 people in this area that they were bombing. That was the reason they were bombing it. Uh, fortunately, most of them had left. Uh, but at any rate, so my first concern was to get my rifle clear so if I needed it, I could use it. So I proceeded to try to do that and get the mud out of it. Well, the helicopter in the meantime departed the area where I was at. So <clears throat> after I got my rifle ready, I thought, okay, where's Willie? I look around and I don't see any willy. So I got out and I crawled all the way around the perimeter of the bomb crater because Willie was a big, heavy African-American guy and he carried a radio. And I thought, well, if he jumped out as well, maybe the radio would have hit him in the back of the head and knocked him out or something. So I crawled all around looking for Willie. And it was at that time that I realized that there was no will. I was by myself. And that was always my biggest fear was being captured. And so being by myself was a big concern. Uh, probably the scariest I think I've ever been. So <clears throat> I immediately reached down on my leg where I had a canister of smoke. Because if we were to get separated or, or something happened, we had a wounded, we'd pop a smoke and the helicopters would come back and get us. So I got the smoke off. I got ready to pull it, and about that time, I heard another helicopter go over and went down the valley a ways. <clears throat> and so I thought, well, they're down there, and I'm here. 
I need to get down there. So although it took me a little while to get down there, I crossed the river twice, you know, and finally made it down to where the other guys were. <clears throat> but when we talked about loadout, this particular time, I was carrying a camera, you know, <clears throat> for the government to take pictures of anything that we found as a result of the bomb damage assessment. And under my ass pack, had a big telephoto lens so that we could get pictures even if we couldn't get, you know, close enough, I could, I could zoom in and get them. Well, I forgot I had those cameras on me as I crossed the river about chest deep water uh, twice. So I ruined their cameras and their telephoto lens, scared the heck out of me. I got down and everybody was waiting in a bomb crater, the, whole, the rest of the team. And apparently the gunship, we had, uh, we didn't have Cobras. Uh, we had a B model Huey with two Ford mounted 60s. And our, our gunship apparently had seen me and seen me moving across the river and was reporting back to the team with a little RT-10, you know, that I was coming. And so when I finally got back down there and joined up with people and then we went on to do the uh, damage assessment, we found, uh, you know, 20 or 30 uh, bunkers uh, intermittently spaced out over the area. We found a large area of trench that was covered with canopy, you know, that they could hide in. And about 20 to 25 fire placement, you know, things. So there was quite a bit of activity. We estimate that we saw several blood tracks. We didn't find any bodies. Uh, we're unable to determine if it was animals or if it was people uh, that were wounded. We did find some caches of, of weapons and stuff that we set uh, explosives on to blow up. Uh, but this encampment was very large, uh, and it was probably big enough to accommodate uh, 200 to 400 uh, these in one time. So, again, if you're going into an area where there's that many people and there's only seven or eight of you, the odds are just a little stacked against you. But that was one that I thought was interesting, uh, you know, to, to get it <clears throat> bumped out in a place like that. Uh, another patrol that stuck out a lot in my mind, and you had alluded to earlier, and I think Andy mentioned it, uh, in June of 67, we were running a patrol uh, south of Anwa uh, into Antenna Valley. We were overlooking Antenna Valley from a high ridge uh, down into the valley where the 2nd Battalion NVA was working, and there was supposed to be an underground hospital someplace uh, down in that area. So <clears throat> we had we would normally, you know, find a, an area where we could observe the area that we wanted to be, be looking at in particular. And there was this one spot on the side of the ridge line near the crest where we could get good vision on the on the valley below and on the uh, village that we were looking at. So normally we would pick that area, we would move past it. And then as it became, got close to dark, we would find a place to harbor for the night and we would break up and separate, you know, like four men and three men or four and four in two groups that were slightly separated from each other. Uh, so that if we were discovered at night or, you know, in encountered any enemy you didn't have everybody in one spot we weren't that far apart but uh at any rate as we set in that night for uh for the night sergeant hager uh, who was our light machine gun operator he said doc you and i go back up here i want to take a look again at this observation point that we picked to look down on this village uh at before we come back and set in for the night so Sergeant Hager and I went up and I don't recall exactly. Uh, I think at the time uh, somebody said I might have heard something click or I might have said I heard something click. I don't recall that myself. But we got up to the top of, of the, the ridge line to this observation spot. I stepped around a large tree and something caused me to look down. And as I looked down, Sticking out from under the toe of my boot was two prongs of a Bouncing Betty mine. Uh, Bouncing Betty is a two-stage mine that was developed by the Germans during World War II. 
and it's a quite uh, effective antipersonnel mine in that it's two-staged. Uh, once you step on it, you activate the, the primer. The primer takes about three to four seconds to get down to the charge. And like I said, it's two-stage. It's about the size of a, I'd say, a, you know, a good-sized jar, you know. And once it goes off, the first charge blows the mine up into the air about waist high or chest high. And then the second charge blows it outward. If you took one apart, it looks like about nine rows of vertical standing ball bearings with the charge in the center. So it's very effective. It blows out this way. And uh, it's actually the kind of mine that... Uh, killed uh, Captain Barnes and, and Sergeant Blankenship earlier uh, that we had talked about. Uh, at any rate, I had the two prongs sticking out from under my toe. I realized that once I stepped off of it, because it was a pressure release mine, so once I, I stepped off of it, that it would activate the charge, and four seconds later, it would start all the noisy stuff. Uh, I got Sergeant Hager's attention and, and signaled to him that I had a problem, that I'd stepped on a mine. Uh, he took his time getting over to me because typically when, when they would set a mine, they would set they do what we call seating. They would place other mines in the general proximity of that area so that anybody responding to render aid to someone that might have been wounded uh, in the process or killed would trigger another mine so they'd be more effective. So people responding to me were doing it in a little bit slower, cautious fashion. Uh, Sergeant Hager went back down and got with Andy and the team and let them know what was going on. And obviously they took, they took a little bit of time to get back up to me, uh, being careful to make sure they didn't step on something. Uh, as it turned out, once they got to me, they had indicated that, you know, there really wasn't a lot that they knew to do. It was kind of a, a puzzling thing because it's not something that's that easy to disarm. If you looked at the configuration of the mine, it has its three prongs at the top and it has a shaft. Well, in this shaft that goes down to the explosive canister, uh, it has a pin. And when the thing hasn't been stepped on, you can put the pin back in it you know, and that disarms the mine. It doesn't allow it to activate uh, the, the fuse. Uh, unfortunately, if you step on it, now those two holes don't align anymore. So there was no way to dig down and isolate and, and disarm this mine. So after a little bit of discussion, they decided, well, what are we going to do? How are we going to address this? So the decision was made that they would take the, the packs that we carried, and we and again, we carried large, heavy packs. They would take everybody's packs and they would put them in a kind of a horseshoe around the front of me, and that they would give me the backup radio man's PRC-25, you know, which is about this wide and this tall and about four inches thick, and that I could hold that on my chest and then <clears throat> they would leave me, and when I got ready, I could fall backwards. And because of the way the mine is designed to explode outward like this, that I would most likely be missed by all the projectiles, that I'd be injured from the impact of the, of the explosion, but that I wouldn't get hit with a ball bearing, uh, which, you know, I didn't think was a real good idea, but there were no others. So they decided that they would call a medevac helicopter, get something on station so that, you know, they could treat me if they needed to once ever uh, this thing went off. And so they did, did the packs and gave me the radio and they decided to go downhill. That's the picture of a bouncing Betty. You can see the shaft and the, the three prongs at the top, you know, well, two of them are missing on that. Well, that's you know, just hard to see. But at any rate, uh, I, I, like a typical young man, I, I took the radio and I thought, well, this radio is not very big. I can hold it up here and it'll protect my head and my heart, but then my stomach and 
all these other things that I really wanted to have use of the rest of my life uh, were exposed. And I thought, well, that's not a good idea. Well, if I hold it down here, I'll protect my stomach and my uh, manhood, but my heart and my head are exposed. And so finally I came to the conclusion that there just wasn't a good way to do this. So finally, after waiting a while and, and they thought, I guess I would never get around to it. I, I held the radio up, like I said, and I fell backwards, didn't go off. And the only thing that we could conclude was that because it was under the toe of my boot and because the jungle boots were so heavily cleated that the one prong that was under my foot must have gone between the cleats. And they were about oh, a quarter inch or more between the cleats. So if I'd have been an eighth of an inch either side, then it would have gone off and it would have been an explosion. So it was very lucky. So we rigged the mine the next day, blew it in place. And you could hear people down in the valley cheering when the thing went off. Um, mm. So it was active. It was hot. Uh, just good Lord was with me that day and didn't go off. So that one uh, I remember very well. That's why I have all this gray hair. <laughs> and uh, I guess the last one, the one that you know I think would probably be a, a good bit of interest, uh, is obviously the one that, that got us a lot of notoriety. Uh, mm -hmm. It was an unusual patrol. Uh, it was a little bit larger patrol than we normally ran. Uh, and this one was the one that got actually covered by Newsweek magazine and made the August issue of Newsweek magazine, uh, you know, with pictures of us and the equipment, some of the equipment that we captured and the flags associated with the crack north of it and the unit we encountered. Uh, this particular operation, yeah, as you can see, this is this is the group of people that were involved. These are some of the weapons uh, that we captured and the flags, again, that were indicative of uh, again, the communist flag and then uh, battalion flags, this particular unit that we end up making contact with uh, was the 402nd Sapper Battalion, which is a crack North Vietnamese uh, uh, unit that designed to, to, you know, overrun artillery, you know, locations and things like that. They were, these were no slouches. These were uniform wearing well-trained, well-equipped uh, individuals that we encountered. And if you were looking for pictures, if you noticed just to the lower right of the communist flag with his hat turned up so his mother would recognize him as me. That's, that's me there. And, <laughs> in the, but at any rate, uh, a little bit about this patrol. This patrol was, uh, again, there were 15 of us, which is just about a full platoon size. It was a hand-picked group of people. Uh, it was our normal killer cane team, as well as people, you know, other gunnery sergeants and people like that with other expertise. We were to be uh, back again in that wonderful place called Happy Valley. Uh, but this one was in support of Operation Pecos, which was an operation where the Marines were sending in company size elements uh, to go into Happy Valley. And this killer cane or reinforced killer cane was acting as a screening, screening team or in a blocking force. So we expected to make contact, you know, with larger groups of people in that area, which is normal for that area. Uh, so we were quite ready for these folks. Uh, we had per were proceeding through the jungle and we were coming down off of a ridge line when the team stopped and they passed back the sign, you know, enemy ahead. Uh, so as we came off this ridge line, there was a stream bed and this stream bed wrapped around the, this finger uh, ridge that we came down off of. Unfortunately, at the time, uh, we weren't, not that it would have probably made a lot of difference, but we didn't realize there were as many people as there were. Uh, what we could see was approximately seven people standing in the stream bed. Uh, 
So uh, Andy found a team around to try to bring as much fire onto that area as we could. And uh, once we were ready, we opened fire on them. Uh, we could see one gentleman that apparently was an officer. He had a, a pouch around uh, hanging off to one side and a pistol. Uh, the others were, were just, and they were all in uniform. Well, we immediately killed four of the seven people uh, that we saw. Uh, the unfortunate thing was, is the stream bed wrapped it back around and what we weren't able to see was there were probably around 40 something people of this crack full second sapper uh, battalion group sitting down resting on the side. Uh, so it was quite a firefight for a while, quite a bit of activity and noise. Uh, they obviously, we caught them by surprise. They scattered uh, after the reaction force got there and when we swept down into the, the stream bed itself there were still something like 34 packs that were just all stacked along there where they had been resting and taking a break from their travels through the jungle. Um, we sat in that area for a while uh, and we sent out a couple of, of little feelers to try to make sure no one was coming back and trying to circle back around and, and come back on us. And Sergeant Hager and one of the gunnies had gone out and they ended up running into a couple and killing a couple more. So in, in the end, we, we killed several of those people. Uh, the rest, you know, we scared off. We captured a lot of uh, equipment, uh, you know, several B-40 rocket rounds, uh, rock, I mean, rocket launchers, uh, a couple of light machine guns, AK-47s, carbines, and 34 packs. And it wasn't until we started to look in, in one uh, patrol pouch, which happened to belong to an officer, contained a lot of documents, uh, were very useful to the intelligence group. Uh, contained within the packs was uh, quite a bit of, of personal equipment and you know things that a guy would normally carry, pictures of his family and kids back in North Vietnam. But also included in, in these packs were small one ounce bars of gold oh. and piaster, which was Vietnamese money, American dollars, you know, uh, a lot of things like that, that were of great intelligence value. Uh, obviously these people were well-funded, well-supported. They were well-equipped. Uh, not only did they have AK-47s, which were, you know, goods, Kalashnikov, you know, 7.62 uh, machine guns, but they also, we had AK-50s, which was the newer version with the aluminum magazines, you know, uh, and fiberglass stocks instead of wood stocks uh, where the normal AKs had that uh, type 56 light pod, bipod machine guns. Uh, so these guys were, were very well equipped. Uh, they were very knowledgeable. Uh, and we were just very lucky, you know, we, we caught them in, in a, at a bad time. Uh, otherwise, we would have had a, a much different outcome, I'm sure. Uh, and as a result, so they called back to the rear and the fine was so significant that they immediately sent helicopters out. We, we went to an LZ. We took all this heavy equipment because all this stuff was really heavy besides what we were carrying. We had to lug all this stuff. They loaded all this stuff up and it went back to the rear. And we thought, well, surely after, you know, such a, a good accomplishment and, and such a big scrap that we got in, because we made lots and lots of noise, everybody knew where we were at and that we were there, uh, they left us in the field. They took all the stuff and flew away and they left the team in the field and we stayed in the field another day or two, uh, continuing as part of this screening and blocking operation for Operation Pecos. Uh, so it was quite interesting. So when they finally extracted us uh, and came back to Reasoner, when we got out there and we came up, we were all still nasty and dressed and painted in our camouflage. That's when we found that Newsweek magazine had heard about it and they were there at Camp Reasoner and that's where the pictures that they took as we came off the, uh, 
uh, the helicopters with all of the captured equipment and stuff like that that you see in the picture. You know, again, uh, we got a lot of publicity, we got a lot of notoriety, uh, but it was just typical of the type of operation that Gilder Kane ended up involved in. Uh, the picture that you're showing is, is really interesting because as you would classically find, you know, uh, a lot of times we would capture, you know, weapons, we would capture packs, we would capture, you know, various um, homemade gas masks, you know, various things like I had a, a brass French canteen uh, that we had taken off of, of some people we ambushed. And that went all the way back to the 50s when the French were in Indochina. But what happened a lot of times was this stuff would end up getting going back and other people uh, in the organization uh, would want to collect some of these souvenirs themselves. And that was the case for the flags that, that you saw that we had, that we captured the three flags, a communist flag and two battalion flags. Uh, they were quite prized. Uh, so some people at, at Division just indicated that they wanted those flags, that they wanted to receive those flags as part of that process. Uh, someone, fortunately, was smart enough and said, hey, I got an idea. There's a, a, a seamstress down here. We'll have them make up some imitation flags to mimic the ones that we actually captured and then you know, we can sign those and you can present those. So what you're seeing, the three flags that are being held up are not the original flags that we captured. They are substitute flags that were made up in order to be able to give them or present them to uh, other people who wanted, you know, uh, war trophies. Uh, and unfortunately, but that's, that is, that's what you see. Uh, those were fakes that were made up uh, to allow people to have something. Uh... That, that's one of my favorite stories. And it was the gunny, if I'm not mistaken, because Andy was was so upset and was like, man, they've already gotten the weapons. The other team is trying to take care credit for it. And he's like, settle down, settle down. He's like, well, how can I settle down? We're about to hand off all of this stuff we worked so hard for. And he's like, don't worry about it. That just don't worry about it. They yeah. show up the next day and he's look at them and he's like, these aren't the flags, are they? He's like, I told you don't worry about it. And they went in there and took that photo and no one's the wiser. <laughs> well, one of the things that a lot of people don't uh, actually realize, but, you know, some of the old gunnery sergeants that are around, that have been around so long, they know the ropes, they know the processes, they know all the ins and outs of how to do things. And, you know, we've been out on patrols where during the summer we were on some patrols down near Antenna Valley and uh, very little cover. It was low profile grass, a little bit of elephant grass and stuff, but you were in the hot sun and very quickly consumed all of your water. There was no ability to go down to any streams and stuff because that's where they were. Mm -hmm. If you went down there, you almost always made contact. So it wasn't... And, you get an old, you call back to the rear, and the next thing you know, some gunnery sergeant, you know, Gunny T, Gunny Trebathian, he'd go gather up water in these uh, supposedly unbreakable uh, tubes, you know, foam or uh, rubber tubes, and next thing you know, you'd see a helicopter that fly over the ridge, and they'd kick these out, and, you know, we'd get water, and it was people like that that took care of us. Uh, one of my one of the guys that unfortunately was killed, I still wear his. Anyway, I wear his bracelet to this day. Uh, when I was with Second Battalion Recon in in Camp Lejeune, uh, Gunny uh, there that I met that that uh, taught me very uh, sternly, uh, kicking my ass is probably the best way to say it. Uh, I came back in off of a long force march and the first thing I did was jump in the shower and clean up. And he came and got me by the nap of the neck and brought me back in there and he said, son, you're the corpsman. These are your Marines. 
You don't go clean your ass up until you've checked every one of them, looked at their blisters, taken care of them, and made sure your Marines are okay. Then you can go clean your, you know. And so that's the kind of people that really were the backbone of it. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Gunny Alawine was killed on the patrol while I was there. So. Mm. What a man. I mean, uh, that that's uh, like you said, those old gunnies that have been around in the system for a long. I mean, if you just sit and listen and pay attention, my God, the, the amount of wisdom they could pass on to you that that you couldn't get anywhere else except for straight from the horse's mouth from them. I mean, what a man. What a man. I, I'm sorry to hear about his passing uh, while he was on a patrol. I, I hate to hear that. Um. Did you, uh, we're right now, we're almost at the hour 45 mark. Um, would you like to hit the questions? And then maybe if we've got a little bit of time left, we might can uh, cover a little bit more or something. Sure, I'm fine. Okie dokie. Um, well, we actually probably just, uh, well, this is a good one right here. Um, while you were around, who was the oldest man in Force Recon? Not well, not necessarily running Recon, but who was the oldest man in the in in First Force while you were around that you can remember? Well, generally, you you were looking at the old Gunny Gunny Trevathan, you know, uh, Gunny Alawine. These these were, they were all men by standards. You have to remember that the average age for the guys in the team was probably 19, 20. Uh, Andy was the old man. He was like 22, 23. Uh, but I, I would say probably guys like uh, Gunny Trevath and Gunny Allen were probably old men. They were in their late 30s, 38, you know, 40 maybe, but right along that line. Not all that old by today's standards. So. Yeah. <laughs> but for recon standards, they were old timers. <laughs> yeah. Jason's got an interesting question. Always interested in this as well. Uh, was there anyone else on Killer Kane or Swiss Scout when y'all changed the name that you had uh, that had been cross trained maybe by you in case you were wounded or weren't able to perform medic medic duties, corpsman duties? Yeah, one of the things that that Andy was a real big proponent of was cross training. Uh, you know, again, like I said, I, I cleared a, an M seventy nine for a while as well. Uh, but in terms of medical training to make sure that people were, were able to handle it if something happened to me, uh, there weren't that many times, but when we were in the rear, sometimes we'd have a class. Uh, we were on a, an observation on Hill 452 overlooking the Bonson River and the Bonson coal mines. Uh, and so you're up there for a week to 10 days. And during that time, I would hold classes, you know, how to install tourniquets, you know, how to start out of the, how to do compression bandages and things like that. So there was cross training. Uh, and as I indicated before, of course, I carried my E1 kit, you know, uh, in, in, with the IVs and things like that. But every guy carried some, you know, uh, four before compressed bandages and and tourniquets and stuff on themselves. Uh, uh, so, you know, again, we were fortunate, I was fortunate in that majority of the time there was no one seriously wounded, you know, uh, on the team. You know, lots of us picked up shrapnel and things like that. You know, uh, Bart Russell got shot in the face around, just barely grazed his face. Uh, you know, things like that. So a lot of my in-depth skills weren't, can fortunately have to be used on my own team, mostly simple bandaging and, you know, leech bites and trap, small shrapnel wounds and things like that. Uh, on occasion, uh, we did, if, if we encountered someone, the picture that you pulled up was a picture of me treating a wounded North Vietnamese artillery lieutenant. Uh, we ran into these people on the trail, uh, in November, uh, had, had killed one and wounded one. The others right behind him got away. Uh, this gentleman was shot twice in the chest uh, by one of our guys. Uh, and 
So we made our way down to get him. We brought him back and, and I worked with him for about an hour. Uh, but, you know, I didn't think I was going to be able to save him, uh, but I tried. So I worked on him for about an hour and he finally died. Uh, and so we wrapped him up in a poncho and left a note on it, a note on him for the people that found him that, you know, compliments the United States Marine Corps. Uh, and uh, uh, much respect for y'all for I, I, when I hit that part, I, I thought I, that w was an amazing display of uh, of uh, humility, um, true, true uh, warriors, not uh, because the NVA, I, I, they might have, but I doubt they'd ever give y'all the consideration that you gave that man right there. Uh, of leaving him to where the, his compatriots could at least find his body and bury it. Uh, that, 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 that stuck out in the book immediately when, when I read that. And then when I first heard y'all talking about that, I was like, very few people uh, w would do something like that. I, I, that really stuck, struck a note with me, with you guys. Yeah. Well, you know, those are the kinds of things that, you know, are the unfortunate part of the war. Uh, you know, uh, we did kill quite a few people, uh, you know, by actual, you know, weapons fire, which again was unusual, but was attributed to the aggressive nature of, of Killer Kane. Uh, wasn't, wasn't a lot of effort made in the early patrols, you know, uh, to take any kind of prisoner. You know, it wasn't listed in the patrol reports in terms of what they intended, sent you to an area with a, with a particular mission. Now, towards the end, you know, you get into October, November uh, of 67 while I was there. If you read the patrol reports, you know, it, it would read, you know, you go observe and, you know, be ready to call in artillery or, or airstrikes against identified targets, you know, and if the opportunity affords itself, take prison. So that wasn't normally part of the, the process uh, until late in 67 when they were trying to gather additional information uh, on the, the buildups that were coming for Tep. Did, uh, I can't really remember offhand, did, did y'all have uh, any success in, in getting some POWs back? I think I remember one for sure. In, in the in the latter part of '67, they did, uh, you know, uh, you know, we you had pictures of, of ones that, that you know were captured, uh, but not many, not many, at least while I was there. Yeah, I mean, and as aggressive as y'all were, I, I don't think they had enough time to duck and cover and get out of the way of what was coming after them for y'all to. To, to, to be getting prisoners. Uh, there's going to be a good question coming up on some intelligence uh, usage uh, we'll get to here in just a second. I um, think we may have covered this, but um, the biggest haul you had in terms of capturing something, that was uh, the, the photos we showed, uh, the sappers y'all hit and the, uh, the weapons y'all gathered. Would that be y'all's biggest uh, grab? You know, uh I would say yes, you know, the one that got the most notoriety, certainly. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't unusual, uh, you know, to, to, to capture weapons. Uh, usually it was a small number from, if you kill four people, you obviously had their weapons and their equipment uh, and stuff. You know, we took, we did take pictures. Uh, mm -hmm. There had been some people that, reportedly had observed what they thought were Chinese advisors uh, working with them. I never saw any of myself, but we did take pictures to validate, you know, who the people were, the equipment that they were carrying, uh, you know, the size of the individual, because these supposed Chinese advisors they saw were much larger in stature uh, than the average Vietnamese uh, that we encountered. Uh, we did in several places, uh, you know, find caches of rice. Uh, we made one patrol where we, we stumbled into quite, uh, quite naturally a training area. This mm -hmm. training area uh, had 
a raised platform where the instructors were, were teaching from, uh, a, a tower, uh, some other little hooch type places. Uh, they had a, a big board and on this board were drawings and caricatures of how to effectively shoot at a helicopter to teach them how to lead a helicopter and firing at a helicopter. So, you know, fortunately there wasn't anybody there when we found all of that. So, you know, we, we did find a lot of stuff, you know, uh, when we did the BDA that I talked about, we found, you know, some, some rocket storage stuff and some equipment, which we blew up in place. Uh, it wasn't unusual, but yeah, there were some, probably the one where you saw, uh, with uh, Newsweek was probably one of the larger ones. Wow. And yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that's a big one, especially when at that time, when, uh, when Newsweek comes across it. Um, I, I thought I remember uh, Andy maybe mentioning he actually uh, used or I know, I, I think he captured some East German gear that he mentioned on one of y'all's patrol. Do y'all, do you remember that ever coming across? No, I, I don't remember that particular one. Uh, again, you have to remember Andy was a few months before yeah. I was, and he was a month after I left country in November. Uh, it wasn't unusual to find, you know, other things. You know, I had alluded to the brass French canteen that I had uh, and stuff like that. Uh, but what, what is really is funny, and, and it, was, it was things that you wouldn't believe or you wouldn't normally think would be of intelligence value. Uh, one time we had run into some people, killed a few of them, and gathered some, some packs and uh, firearms as a result of it. And contained within these packs was some rice candy. Now, we, we like I said, we were always thirsty. We were always hungry. You never could carry enough of that stuff. So we were going to eat the candy that we found in these packs. I mean, hey, it was something to eat. It was candy. What value could that be? And Andy, in his, in his wisdom, said no. That may be of value. You're not going to do that. So we didn't get to eat the candy. And as it turned out, it actually was of value because that particular candy was limited supply. It was manufactured in Da Nang, and it allowed them to backtrace this mm. to some vendors that had that. And so these these Vietnamese were getting this candy from locals in the Da Nang area. So it led to intelligence probably knocking on their door late at night and talking to them about how these people managed to get candy, you know, that is nowhere available but in your stores. Uh, so things that you wouldn't expect had, had value. Oh, yeah. Man, that that is uh, that's some real uh, detective work there, working it back to the source and 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 finding out that. I mean, that kind of reminds me of uh, Andy's second book is uh, well, second tour, yeah, second tour and second book when he was with the PRU organization and all the the snooping and pooping and and in, intel work he was doing. I mean, that that's interesting. I I I don't think I'd ever heard that story or Andy mentioned it it may be in his book but i don't i don't remember that that's amazing I, I don't recall that being written down any place it's just when you were talking about intelligence i was thinking mm -hmm. how simple you know things could be of, of importance we captured a lot of stuff that was was important you know uh the one in the newsweek thing that pouch that the officer was carrying you know had a lot of intelligence documents in it you know area locations, maps, places to go, contacts to make, you know, that provided a lot of intelligence that benefited us, you know, uh, in a bigger picture. So, uh, and we've actually got one that uh, is pretty good intel question. Uh, this is a comment. Thank you, Tex, for the donation. I appreciate that greatly, brother. Uh, you guys are the Marines doctors. There's no better in the business than a Navy corpsman, chesty puller, simplified doc. <laughs> well, it, it's really nice that you, you know, 
that you get those kind of comments. And I would have to say, as a corpsman, spending time with the Marines, uh, no one treated you any better or, or with more respect. You know, uh, Coleman were looked up to, you know, uh, and, and well taken care of, you know. Uh, when you when we traveled in the bush, you know, uh, and we're moving through the jungle, the group of, of seven or eight people, they always positioned you towards the back, mm -hmm. you know, so that if contact was made, you know, you were less likely to be injured right away so that you were available to take care of them, you know. If you got in a bind or anything went on, you know, they took care of you. Uh, the guy that I remember the most, if you if you looked at the team, and we had one big African-American guy, and he was, he was like a, he said he was, he was just gigantic, you know. And he could carry anything, and he, he had carried more food, more water than anybody else. You know, you couldn't load him down, and he carried an M60 machine gun when we carried it. Charles Norman Williams, Willie Williams, and Willie just kept me from starving to death. This this wasn't Willie. This was another oh. gentleman uh, that unfortunately was killed on Hill 452 when lightning struck an ammo bunker and blew him off the hill. Oh, that's that gentleman. Oh God, that is a tragic, tragic story. Um, is that Willie? No, uh, this is. Uh, um, he was the gentleman that shot the, um, uh, he was not normally part of our team. We carried him from time to time. Excellent in the bush, big, tall, slim guy. Uh, oh gosh, I gotta remember his name. Uh, but he's the one that shot the, uh, infantry artillery lieutenant that I was patching up that you had a picture of over there. If you, if you go back to the picture that uh, was on the LZ where we're all sitting down. Oh, oh uh, you mean at, L, uh, at Reasoner? The, yeah, at Camp Reasoner. Uh, bear with me, guys. I've got a, about 70 photos okay. of. Boy, you got, yeah. Well, it's just um, one that you had pulled up earlier. There we go. Okay. If, you, if you look on the lower right-hand side, that's Willie Williams. Charles Norman Williams from Brooklyn, New York, you know, and biggest hearted guy you'd ever want to be around. You know, in some of your interviews in the past, uh, you've had people ask questions like, well, did you ever see any elephants? And when I think about Willie, Willie kept me from starving. I was skinny, weighed about 155 pounds, and I couldn't carry enough food and water to last me a full patrol and Willie could he was like a buffalo I mean he could carry anything and so Willie would give me food and Willie would give me water and kept me going so that's what I mean they take care of you but when they ask about elephants we were down near Charlie Ridge which was in the southern portion of our operating area uh, just kind of northwest of Chula and we had seen elephant dung on, on the trails that we had crossed a couple of times. And so we broke up and set in for the night that night. And we would normally keep one man up and the other three people in that little breakaway cluster. You know, uh, the one man that was up, man the radio, you know, and, and gave the okay back to Beacon Light, which would check in with us to make sure we were okay. You never talked on the radio. You just clicked the handset to, to let them know you were listening and you were alive. Uh, Willie was up listening on the radio, and we heard some elephants braying in the distance. And so Willie reached over and he woke me up. He said, Doc, Doc. I said, yeah, man, what's the matter? You know, because you're, you're being real quiet, you know. And, and all I can remember was, Willie was looking at me, and his eyes were this big around. All I could see was two big white spots. And he said, do you hear that, Doc? And I said, yeah, it's elephants. He said, what if they come in here? So I said, oh, hell, just shoot them. You know, so we never saw them. 
they were they were using them as pack animals in the area. Never we never physically saw them. We just saw the dung. We heard them that night. But it it really upset Willie bad that he might have an elephant come walking into that area and he didn't know what to do with it, you know, but good guy, good guy. Talk about a nightmare. Uh, that, that I've heard a few teams, uh, uh SOG teams having elephants run through their RO wins and it, it caused a, a, a hell of a ruckus. And a, a few of the guys actually had to unload the car 15s and actually bring it down they hated killing animals uh tigers and all that unless they had to and yeah. they hated killing that that elephant but it was going to trample the whole team that night well usually the most common animal that you ran across you know short of leeches and things like that yeah uh, saw a few snakes you know a couple of bamboo vipers but nothing much and not many of them the most common thing that we saw and it was really a, a startling thing sometimes was the monkeys oh, yeah. because the monkeys would, would be in the trees and you're, you know, going through the jungle and depending on where you're at, you may have, you know, primary canopy, 30, 40 foot of heavy brush and then prime and then base canopy all the way up to maybe 90 feet tall. And you'd be very quietly working your way through the jungle and all of a sudden noise would break out. Monkeys are screaming. And we had startled a group of monkeys and then run through the trees across, you know, so it scared the heck out of you because of the, the, you know, all of a sudden noise. But it was also, if you think about it, it it was not a good sign because if you startled them and they made all that noise, it let somebody else know that someone else, they didn't know who, was in the area and had startled the monkey. So they, they could give away your position as well. There were teams that, you know, had spotted tigers and had tigers follow them. Uh, we never personally saw any. We heard some things we suspected might have been, but we didn't know if it was enemy following us or, you know, whatever. So. Yeah, those tiger stories we hear in Force Recon, sadly, and Battalion Recon, they've, they've got a few bad ins run-ins with tigers to where recon men were dragged out of the wagon wheels at night and 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 killed and uh they did get the tiger for retribution but it's always sad uh not only losing a, a recon man like that but you know having to kill a, a beautiful majestic animal like that but i'm i'm not gonna as well as the guys i'm not gonna take a chance he's gonna get one of a, another one of us the next night or what have you so you know you gotta do what you gotta do and I, uh, I, the, the snake stories, I, I, I don't see how y'all, especially at night, the spiders, the snakes, the, the leeches, I, it just the heebie jeebies on, on what could possibly not only just walk or crawl on y'all at night is, is just mind blowing. <laughs> yeah. The, the leeches were the biggest aggravation. You couldn't feel them, you know, and, and again, it, it's kind of comical. It's that learning factor. I remember on one of my earlier patrols when I was doing my breakout, uh, we were sitting in a spot and I saw this little worm on a bush and, and it was standing up and it was doing this, you know, like it was sniffing around. And so I made a comment to one of the, the guys on the team I was with and I said, look at that. I think it's an inch worm. And he laughed at me because no dummy, it's a leech. He's He's smelling around looking for you. And, you know, you, you, we blast our boots, you know, and we'd spray insect repellent around, you know, any of the openings. Usually kept your sleeves down, even though it was hot. Uh, and they'd still find their way in. And you, you would never know one was on you till you, you know, reached down and you felt something on your leg or on your arm or your body. And it wasn't there. You know, and you, they would just be gorged with blood, you know, and they hadn't released yet, you know, and the normal tendency would be to pull it off. And you'd do that in the beginning. But we mm -hmm. learned that when you pull them off, the head remains in there. It gets infected and swells up, you know. So we learned this when you found them, you know, and they'd get in, they'd get in your groin, they'd get in your legs, they'd get on your chest and your arms. So they just went where they wanted to go. Ah. Uh, one of the things that, as a corpsman, 
I did, you know, one of the assignments that you get that I learned again from Gunny Allawine the hard way was when we would get back in, you know, we'd go to debrief. So they went in, they debriefed you, they talked to everybody. What did you see? What did you hear? You know, what, what was this? What was that? So that they gathered a composite idea of what all we saw and did, you know, and then we'd be released, you know, we'd dump our ammo and stuff. We'd go back to the hooch and dump, and we'd head to the shower. Well, my job was to go to the shower and I would wait until the guys came out of the shower. And we had a, when I say a shower, it was a, it was a crude apparatus made out of a drop tank and they filled with water. And then you'd go in and you could pull the thing and you got water out, warmed water from the sun uh, to shower and clean up in. And then as the guys came out, I would look at them from head to toe uh, to see scrapes and scratches, leech bites, anything like that, uh, heat rash. And then it was basically my responsibility to, you know, blisters on their feet. So anything that I observed, I then took care of, you know, making sure that, you know, they had, we had some medicine that we had mixed up uh, for heat rash. You, you were bad because you were in the heat and you can imagine under your arms and your groin, uh, things like that, you would get prickly heat and this stuff would rub on and it just like, it just set you on fire, but it did take care of it. So I patch up and, and touch up you know, people uh, with leech bites and scratches and scrapes and burns and things of that sort, then I'd shower and clean up and go back myself. So just part of taking care of the guys. Yeah, I mean, uh, thank thank God for the Cormans. Uh, I've, I've, I forgot whose book, speaking of the, the leeches, before we get to the next question, um, it was one of the Force Recon books. It may have been Doc Norton or, gosh, I'm blanking on who it was now. Nonetheless, uh, they, uh, oh, it may have been Andy's second book when he was with the rifle company. They actually were on a patrol, and I believe one of the young men new in country got a leech, thought he got it on his groin. Little did he know he woke up or came, came up screaming and yelling, they had a leech that went down into his urethra and it, it was, they, uh, they, they were fearing that they weren't going to get him out in time. And luckily they got a dust off out there quick enough to where he could get it out before any terrible damage occurred. But that's one of the most scary and just heebie jeebie leech stories I've ever heard in my life. Them making their way downtown, so to speak. <laughs> Well, you know, it, it wasn't unusual, uh, you know, a lot of um, mine in particular, guys on my team, you know, you put on your clothes, you painted your face, you sealed up all your pores and stuff like that. And so you were in a hot, sweaty environment and you had those and you maintained those. You never got out of your clothes. You never got out of your shoes and socks, you know, for four days to a week at a time on a patrol, you know. You slept on the ground in the rain. You had all those, you know, ants and, and leeches and things like that. So it wasn't that unusual. Uh, most of the guys, you know, had fungus under their toenails. And, you know, my feet looked like you had shot them with a BB gun. They had little tiny holes all over and all my nails were yellow. You know, uh, I, I ended up with, with some, some uh, penis problems, uh, from the heat and the sweat and nasty uh, and okay. ended up out on the USS repos for a couple of days, uh, you know, getting some, some treatment out there. So it, it wasn't unusual at all to, to have other maladies associated with just literally the, the horrible environment that you lived in and worked in uh, as part of your patrol activity. Speaking of feet, I've never, seen a set of feet uh god bless his soul I'll, I'll love him to death and miss him every day but my father i've never seen a set of feet and toenails uh on on a human being in my life even people in the jungles and all of that his feet were so ruined from uh jungle rot immersion foot i, I mean it 
I I would have had I'd have to show you a picture for you honestly to believe me. It, it's like that uh, show on uh, TLC or whatever the 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 uh, that Asian lady the the foot doctor or toe doctor or whatever. I mean it it is it's god awful. But I'm sure most of you Marines and and grunts had dealt with immersion foot uh, quite often. Yeah, it wasn't unusual at all. You know you you did have. The susceptibility to malaria, you know, uh, things like that. So it, it wasn't yeah. unusual. I mean, most of us ended up taking uh, Grizzly Fulvin, which was the primary cure back then. And it took it for almost a year to get the fungus, you know, out. It's, it's really difficult to, to rid your body of. And you have, it kind of balances because it's very, de the medication itself is very detrimental to the liver. So, Things that you live with for a long time. Um, we just passed the two hour and five minute mark. We've got a few more questions here. Uh, and guys, I'm working on something uh, to actually have uh, Doc Connor and Andy reunite and have a uh, team leader and corpsman show uh, together. So uh, we're, we're probably going to end up having him back if y'all end up getting some questions in. Uh, those that watch later, I'll I'll save those. Um, let's see. Yeah, we've got four more. Um, bu -bu -bu one's about. Oh, this is good from Glenn. Um, he's curious when uh, the ambush that you guys set up. Who uh, in the NVA VC who would be targeted first in the ambush? Well, just by nature of ambushes, uh, I can't say that we ever targeted any particular person in an ambush. Uh, usually, if you set up an ideal ambush, uh, you would pick the right terrain, and typically you'd set up an L-shaped ambush uh, where you would have your, uh, your stoner machine gun or your M60 firing down the trail, down the kill zone. Uh, a lot of times we would set a claymore at the front, you know, uh, so that it would it would blow down the, the kill zone, and then the rest of the people would be on the side, and then you would designate, you know, okay, you fire automatic, you fire semi-automatic, you fire automatic, you fire, and this was done so that you didn't all run out of ammunition because you can go through 20 or 30 rounds on an M16 in a hurry. Uh, so that way you didn't have everybody changing magazines at the same time. And we would typically set up an L like that, you know. Uh, you'd move, if you moved into an area, you'd find, especially in areas where the, uh, the Vietnamese were trying to move large numbers of people, uh, mm -hmm. they didn't like to be detected. So as soon as they got closer to populated areas like Happy Valley, which is a major enforce, uh, influx area into that part of the country, uh, if they had 200 people to move, they'd run 15 or 20 people down the trail and then 15 or 20 minutes later they'd run another group down the trail so as you observe them over time you were able to pattern what they did so if you were going to set up an ambush right before extraction to gather intelligence information you'd let a group go by and you knew that the next group was going to be here in 15 20 minutes you set up your l-shaped ambush you know we'd put our gas mask up on our head get tear gas out and then when the next group walked in, they set off the claymore, machine gun and fire, the guys that fired down, then would pull our gas mask down, throw tear gas out. And if you heard any coughing or hacking, I think we fired up a little bit more. Uh, and then once that ambush had been conducted, you got most of the people in the kill zone. You know, if it was a large enough group, some may have gotten away. Uh, but you kill the contingent of them, and that's where you gathered your intelligence information. Usually, you would send out a corpsman and a cover man to cover him while he looked to see if there was anybody that was as survivable that you could take and patch up as a prisoner. Most of the time, that wasn't the case. They were all dead. Uh, and then I usually took pictures for the government of the wounded, the killed. Uh, that was intelligence value. We'd go through the packs, we'd gather the weapons and stuff, and then we'd, we'd haul ass to get out because when you made 
you know, an ambush like that, you made a lot of noise. So all the people that had just gone down the trail that way were coming back this way to see what was going on. And the people that were over here that were fixing to come down that way were coming this way. So, you know, you drew a lot of attention and you didn't want to stay there a long time. So those processes ran fairly quickly. Uh, but that's usually the way it, it was initiated, you know, a big bang with the Claymore and then everybody opened up with uh, weapons fire. Yeah, yeah, that, I mean, from the sound of that, that you'd be lucky if you got it, unless you were at the end and just ran as soon as you heard a fire uh, pop off. I, I don't see how anybody got out of that ambush. <laughs> uh, here's an interesting question that I was curious about as well. Um, Jason, where did that question go? Gosh. Ah, here we go. Um, Intel wise, were there any exploitation forces or groups who would act on information like y'all would gain in the field from watching or uh, ambushes or the Newsweek gathering? Or would this information be added into force recon info and another force team would go out and act on this? I'm sure that, you know, a, a lot of patrols were, were based on intelligence input from other teams or observations from, you know, like I had mentioned about the bird dog pilot spotting the, uh, the rocket. Uh, and those were responses to inputs. So a lot of the assignments that we gathered were based on other intelligence inputs where other people have observed something or other people have engaged, you know, and as a result of, of debriefs, when you'd come in and your patrol was debriefed, uh, Andy would sometimes make recommendations uh, to intelligence. For instance, uh, on some of the patrols that we made, like on the BDA, because of the number of people that were involved and the potential for contact with large groups, you know, a uh, recommendation would be made that, you know, uh, this area should should uh, receive future patrols, but patrols should be of a larger contingent of maybe platoon size due to the potential for engagement with the enemy. Or uh, it would come in and say, you know, this area is active. There was these many things observed. And there's a hill over here that there's a, is an excellent observation point to observe traffic on these trails so a future team might be sent to, to this area for an option and so a lot of patrols were driven by additional information that was gathered as part of that process in terms of i i am not personally aware of i'm sure that andy would probably be the best source for that information but in terms of how did they respond to and what elements you know, responded to intelligence that we gathered. Uh, so other than other team assignments, I'm sure there are people just like I had alluded when we almost ate that candy and didn't, you know, and it became intelligence value. I'm sure that someone, I don't know who, in the organization or in the South Vietnamese organization acted on that with the local people to, you know, determine who were, you know, supporting the enemy or, you know, colluding with the enemy. Uh, and it, was, it wasn't that uncommon. I mean, they obviously had people that were sympathizers in and around the Nanang area. Wow. Perfect answer. That I mean, that's uh, exactly what I was uh, hoping hoping to hear and, and, and those intricate details. Uh, we've uh, got two more. These are kind of more on the personal end of things, uh, nothing too crazy, but um, Scott is curious, um, what was the most traumatic wound while you were a corpsman that you were faced with uh, and, and trying to deal with? Well, again, like, like I said, you know, because of the, the skill level and the leadership that we had with Killer Kane, I was fortunate in that within the team, I never had that many really serious things. Uh, you know, uh, teasingly, I always used to tell him, you know, the said, guy asked me, he said, does the sight of blood bother you? And I said, no, unless it's mine. 
you know. Uh, most of my wounds, I was wounded three times. Most of mine, I'm embarrassed to say, were, were very minor. Uh, the one patrol report I had gone over, uh, you know, the very first one, you know, when it said there were two of us wounded, I got a small piece of shrapnel right here in the top of my head, another piece here on the side of my head, and one piece in my ear from an exploding grenade. You know, nothing that would slow you down or bother you. In fact, the one on the side of my head uh, stayed there until 2010. I actually had it cut out. Uh, tried to save it as a, as a memento, but, you know, nothing serious with my guys, fortunately. Most serious ones that I ever tried to treat was just like I, you saw with the wounded North Vietnamese lieutenant, you know, gunshot wounds and things like that. Man, oh man, uh, this is a uh, an interesting, and I'll be actually anxious to see what what your answer will be to this. Um, Alex is curious. Can you talk about your proudest moment from your time in the service? The moment you look back on that makes you the most proud. <laughs> As Andy alluded to in his books, you know, um, Killer Kane was fortunate, you know, in that we got so much exposure. Uh, and a lot of the guys deserve, uh, you know, a lot more recognition than perhaps they got. When it came to medals in particular, you know, uh, guys did things that, you know, certainly fell you know, within the, the purview of of acknowledgement from, you know, bronze stars, Navy comms, you know, silver stars, things like that. Unfortunately, you know, because of the reputation that Force Recon has, uh, a lot of times when Andy and, and you know, uh, Berecki and, and Blankenship, they would write people up for things like that, and it would get submitted to division for consideration for acknowledgement for, for, you know, uh, awards and recognition for the, the brave things that they did. Uh, division turned them down most of the time, and Division simply said, well, that's what Force Recon guys do, you know. If he, you know, did all this and, and you know, jumped up like, like Bart Russell, you know, getting up and, and, you know, whacking things away with a light machine gun, and exposing himself to enemy fire, you know. Uh, Bart Russell is one that, that really comes to mind the most. Uh, I, maybe you'll have Bart on and Bart can talk about it, but, you know, people like that are so humble. You know, uh, before every patrol, you would have an overflight uh, the day before to pick out potential landing zones and potential extraction zone and to familiarize the leadership of the team with what was going to take place in that area. Well, Bart was engaged in one of those activities, uh, you know, back when they were up near the DMZ, and they were in a 34 making that overflight. The helicopter was subsequently shot down. Uh, the helicopter crashed into the trees. It swung Bart out, and Bart, as it turned out, was the only survivor uh, in that and so for the next week, Bart hid in the jungles, hid in the river, and actually, you know, eluded the searches that were going on for him as a survivor and made his way down the river and made his way back to the coast and was subsequently, you know, uh, overflying helicopter. He waved and they managed to pick him up. So you got a guy that's a sole survivor that survives for a week in the jungle by himself and eludes the enemy. Good job. That's what recon guys do, you know, whereas, you know, certainly not something that the average guy goes and does. Doesn't need to talk about, it. you know. So that that was, I guess, you know, my, my biggest thing. I, I was lucky. I, I got a bronze star, you know, uh, and one meritorious combat promotion, but that was really unfair to a lot of the guys that did much more, you know, 
I was just looked at differently as a corpsman, you know, you know, you know, oh, well, you're doing something special where guys do much more and got nothing. So, yeah. Well, you, uh, uh, you, uh, that, that's been since I've been speaking to you guys and, and reading and learning more about Force Recon, that's been, Besides uh, y'all not getting the tool, the adequate tools that y'all need, and y even though y'all make do with whatever y'all can get y'all's hands on, uh, the awards, uh, I've, I've always felt extremely uh, sick to my stomach about that uh, because uh, as Andy goes into it in great detail, I mean, he has it out with the, the, the head honchos. I mean, but, you know, just follow it for the end of the, the tour awards and all that and inevitably nobody get awarded and it, it, it there's several patrols all of you men should have should have had had an award uh uh and bard of course uh, uh, uh there, there's just numerous stories that just make my blood boil even speaking about it right now that that nobody got recognized not yeah. not a single recognition not a letter of accommodation nothing no no yeah. no nothing and it wasn't, it is, the thing about it was, is it wasn't just rare instances. You know, you had people that went above and beyond, you know, on the combat jump, you know, when it, it really went, it really went bad. They, they would drop the click off of where they were supposed to be. They ended up in the canopy. They were separated. You know, people like John Sloick and Jim Hager, once they gathered people up and they were eligible to be extracted, John Sloick, Jim Hager volunteered to stay in the jungle and to go look for the guys that they couldn't find, you know. And, you know, Jim Hager gathered a couple of them up and, and got them to an area where people could get out. And that was Bobby Garcia, and you know, that had been tore up his knee and couldn't walk. And, you know, it, so there were people that did really brave things that, you know, they just didn't, there was, you know, hey, you did, you did a good job, you know. The acknowledgement really comes in, in things like being written about, you know, 40 years later about what, you know, what you did and accomplished. So, you know, a lot of special people in Killer Kane did a lot of, a lot of really, you know, significant things and didn't really get the credit that they were due, you know. But you know, Absolutely. they didn't ask for any either. Uh, the 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 men of, of, of really all combat marines, but especially the men of Force Recon that I've had the honor and, and privilege to speak to. You uh, you men are you know the almost humble to a fault, you know, uh, and and that's y'all you know, are true quiet professionals. I know that's the Green Beret saying, but. Um, it's like pulling teeth to get a, a Marine to brag on himself. Uh, you know, Andy, Bart, you, I mean, you, all of y'all, you'd much rather speak about Jim, um, uh, Bart in this case. Yeah, Y'all um, all speak about other men you served with, and maybe we'll, we'll tell us a little bit about something you did when, in fact, you, you were right there along with them doing heroic things and, that's what one of our viewers said. Well said, Doc. Thank you for your time. It means so much to take your time to talk with us. Uh, I, you guys are, are just uh, a different breed of men. Uh, that's all I can say, a different breed. Well, we appreciate that. The Marines, uh, growing up the son of a Marine, uh, I uh, always have a special place in my heart, always. Um, and that, that's why I really... As much as I've been into the SOG stuff, that's why I really try and keep y'all coming on here because I, 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 I y'all have got books out. We've seen the one you've held up. I've got the new edition of Inside Force Recon. I've got Andy's. Uh, there's one called Green Ghost. Um, Andy's got a new one that's coming out now. Uh, but not personally, but he helped contribute to with Rabbi and Bart um, mm -hmm. that I'm really looking forward to. And I think you may have had some input on it. Um, I can't wait for that because that'll be just another book that will preserve y'all's legacy and put these names down in histories for people like me and these younger generations that I'm trying to influence to 
to keep looking at y'all long after I'm gone, long after you're gone, to where they can look back at the at these interviews and hopefully any books that come out and say, my God, what what men we had, you know, in the in the 1960s and 70s. Well, I'd like to thank you too for the job that you're doing. You know, much like the World War II veterans that saw so much. You know, they're almost all gone. You know, most of us now, you know, like in the Killer Kane team, you know, we've already lost several. We lost Sergeant Hager last year to cancer. You know, we're all 77, 78 years old. Andy's pushing 80. You know, uh, we're not going to be around too much longer to talk about what happened and the great people that were there. That's why that's uh... – people ask why I'm so busy and they can't get me on the phone or reach me by emails. And it's literally because I, every free time I have any free chance I have free time I have, I'm either talking to force recon men trying to, or, or SOG men, because like you said, and I hate to even say it, but y'all aren't going to be around much longer. And as much info as, as y'all can share with us and are willing to share all of us watching this, me uh, knowing y'all and getting to talk to you as much as I have. Anytime I get to hear from y'all, talk to y'all and check in on y'all. It, it, it's, it, it's, it highlights my day, highlights my week. Uh, so, I, you know, we're, we're down to the end of the questions, but uh, comments coming in, they, they would definitely love to have you back if you'd, you'd love to join. As I said, I'm trying to, set Andy up. He's going to be going out of uh, the country here later in the month. Yeah. But if it's next month, I would love to have you and Andy together uh, for a reunion show and y'all talk about uh, y'all's time together if you'd be open to it. Certainly. Anytime that I can be of service and pass on information, be glad to do so. And again, I'll always try to take the actual patrol report so there's no BS. It's just all de documented facts. We, uh, I, I was so glad you had that available and, and out to, to, to share with us today. And quite frankly, you may have to, uh, or we may have to go through some of those and pick some out to where you can, uh, cover a few more because I quite, I, I, several people have already said they'd like to hear more, more missions. So we may have to get you back for another solo, quite frankly, even before the, the Andy reunion and, and have you on. That'd be fun. Just let me know when you're ready. Excellent. Excellent. Is there um, anything you'd like to say before we close out this afternoon? No, again, thanks for the opportunity. It's, it, it's, uh, it, it's our pleasure. And I will all on behalf of everybody watching, well, I, I just want to thank you. I know we get to talk privately, but it means a lot for you to share your story on here for future generations. And it means a lot to these viewers to actually get to ask you questions because I'm lucky enough. I get to speak to you whenever you have free time, but these guys don't. And it, it, it really means a lot to, to be able to ask men like you what, what it was like, what you went through and all of that. So from the bottom of our hearts, we appreciate you and uh, we'll be looking forward to having you back home. Okay. Thank you. Have a good one, yeah. bud. Yes, sir. God bless. See all you later. Right.